Well, I'd like you to take a look here at the book of Acts in chapter 1. You know, I looked last week at what we did, and I laid a whole bunch of information on us in just those few verses. And what I want to do is to take 1 through 11 and pick it up where we were and go all the way through it again. Because, I'll tell you why, this, this 1 through 11 is the template, it's the grid out of which the entire church is meant to function. It gives the foundational ideas that will guide the book of Acts, and they're meant to guide the, the church all through its history. Uh, like I said, it's the first log, it's the standard, it's the measure is the book of Acts. And these first 11 verses talk about all of the essentials. Um, I don't know if you remember a fellow back in the uh, 60s through the 70s that coached at UCLA named John Wooden. I remember him. He was maybe the, uh, of, of any coach, he may have been arguably one of the top five coaches that have ever existed in any sport. And um, he won national championship after national championship after na national championship. And his, his, he had a pyramid of success, he called it. And it, the, the basis of it was a mastery of fundamentals. As a matter of fact, John Wooden, whenever he would play another team, he would not scout the other team and get ready to play the other team. He felt that if you did the fundamentals, it would take care of itself. And the first thing that John Wooden would teach his team is when they would come together for the first practice, we do it every year, he would show them how to put on their socks. That there was a way that your sock was supposed to fit inside of your shoe and so he would show them this is where the heel goes these are the toes this is the way it's to be aligned um, and then he would say this is how we put on our shoes and he would show you how to lace up your shoes there was a way to lace them up to stress certain places release certain places and he always wanted his players to know every time they got ready to play from the time they put on their socks and shoes that they knew more than the other team. They were better in the, than the other team. And they worked on, on dribbling, they worked on passing, they worked on blocking out, rebounding, shooting, and running. Those are the essentials. And he said, we're going to do those better than everybody else. Well, in a sense, that is the church. There are certain things the church does as a form when it meets, where it meets, how long it meets, what it studies, those are liquid ideas that can come and go in time and in culture. What you sing, how long you sing, how long you preach, they are liquid. They can come and go. That's called form. But as far as function, why you are here, that can't change. Your identity what you're supposed to be doing, that can't change. And what has happened throughout the history of the church that we forget who we are and why we're here, what we're supposed to be doing, but we just, we get real strong on what we sing, where we meet, how long we meet, pews, not chairs, we use this instrument, not this, we drink instant, not fresh ground, all right. And we get into all of these formal things, but we forget the function. And we end up imploding. We run out from the inside. And so these first 11 verses of Acts 1, you get the, the foundation, the fundamentals of what you're supposed to be doing. You saw your first one was in there in verse 2. He gave orders that the church has a mission we're not a people that get saved and now get a genie to help us be rich and help us be happy. We're not even saved just to go to heaven. It's not just that we get a savior. But now we have orders. We have a head and he guides us. There are things we're supposed to be doing by divine command. All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples, baptizing them, lead them to Christ. Then teach them, and then teach them to obey, and teach them to obey what I commanded you. 
Teach them all that I commanded you. And so he gave them orders. Would you agree so far? There's something we're supposed to be doing. We're saved for a reason. And it's not just to go to heaven. There's a reason God has saved you and left you here. And it's not for God to make you successful. It's for God to make you significant, to do something for him. So he's Savior, but he's head. He's Lord of the church. Let me ask you, does God have the authority to, to direct our lives to do whatever he wants them to do? Can he say to an Abraham, come out from your land, your father and your father's house to a land that I'm going to show you. You're going to have a kid. You're going to raise this nation. And in you, the nation shall be blessed. Does God have that authority to haul you around wherever he wants you? Can he take you as a shepherd and say, throw down your staff. You will now lead my people out of Egypt. And I'm going to take you to this point. You will not go into the land. This guy will. Does God have that authority? Does he have the authority to say to uh, Peter, leave your boat, your father, the servants, and you and your brothers come, follow me, and I'll make you something, and here's what I'll make you, to be a fisher of men. And that he can tell you, this is the way you will die. Does he have that authority? Does he have that authority on your life? As the Lord hath assigned each, and as God hath called each, in this manner let him walk. We are who we are, where we are, how long we are, by the sovereign prerogative of God. And so he says to the church, I'm giving you orders from a commander in chief. And what that mission is, is verse eight, you will be witnesses. I'm gonna give you a message. You don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to be uh, argumentative. You don't have to convince anybody of anything because you can't. Christianity is too adversarial to a man's nature. And so men left to themselves will always become non-Christians and stay non-Christians. But I'm going to give you a message, and your message is me. The message in verse 3 of a dead man who is alive. A divine person who became a human person that became a sinful person on the cross that became a living person when he rose from the dead. And you've got to tell people that, that God has come and died for sin and raised from the dead in victory, and he's coming back. You don't have to be an expert witness, but you do have to have moral courage to stand on that God has communicated truth, that you are a sinner, that Christ is divine, that he has died for sin, that nothing you can do can avail yourself to God, and you receive him by faith, and you will have life after death. You have to have the moral courage to stand. That's the coin of the realm. You don't have to be brilliant and intelligent. Are you glad? You don't have to be persuasive, but you do have to have moral courage. You have to stand on those very adversarial ideas. You got to stand. And so we don't have to convince anybody, but we have to be faithful. A guy goes on, he's a, a witness at a, a shooting, let's say. Uh, what did you see? This guy shot this guy, and I saw it. Here comes the cross examination. What kind of gun was it? Well, I didn't see. Where did he shoot him? I didn't see. How many shots? I didn't see. Attorney stands. Objection. Your Honor, I didn't say he was on a, uh, on a what kind of witness you call him? Uh, give me a word. Expert. This is not an expert. He's not an expert in ballistics. He's not an emergency room employee. We don't claim him to be. But he saw this guy did that to him. And the judge says, sustained, sit down and shut up. All right. So all we have to do is you have to tell the truth so that when God, the Holy Spirit, takes his finger and puts it on their soul and routes out an opening like a cross that your message will fit, that's what you got to do. Okay. And so we have a miss mission. And it's not to be geniuses or it's not to be debaters. What we have to be are people that tell a story, the story of Jesus. And he gives men in verse 3, the 12, they are apostles. 
They are the foundation of the church. That the authority of the Christian message isn't built upon people that get enlightenment ideas out under some tree or come out of the woods with golden tablets. They're not people who have mystical visions. They're not people that have emotional experiences. You don't get to be final and authoritative because you felt a liver quiver and you feel that something is true. As a matter of fact, if you're born after 90 AD and you're not one of these 12 guys, you and I don't get to contribute to the knowledge authoritatively of God. Is that okay with y'all? And so nobody gets to do it. These 12 guys are going to be the apostolic authoritative witnesses. None of us will see him. Blessed are those who believe and don't see. But we're going to believe the message of these 12 guys. All of Israel is born from the 12 tribes. All of the Christianity, true Judaism, New Testament Judaism, are going to be born out of these 12 men. You will believe their message on the person of Christ. And uh, that's why when John, the last one, dies, we conclude his book with, you add to this, and I add to you the plagues. You take away from this, I take away your place from eternal life. That you're a lost man if you do this. And so, we have a final standard of truth. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will guide you, you 12 men, into how much of the truth? All the truth. Nobody else gets to speak. Their tradition does not come on the level of inspired truth, and no interpreter gets to put his message on the level of truth. I don't care if it's David Koresh. I don't care if it's throw your own cult in there. Nobody else gets to put their standard on the standard of divine truth. Those are the rules. Amen? It's not the Pope. It's not the Bishop of Constantinople. It's not Calvin. It's not Luther. It is Peter, Andrew, James, John, the guys that wrote. It's a done deal right there. And so is that kind of an important truth? Yeah. Christ is the foundation, and then you have 12 two es petras, 12 stones, of which Peter was the leader of the 12, two es petras. And they will declare what is bound and what is loosed. So we have a standard of truth. It's called the New Testament. And then we have a means by which it occurs. In verse 2, by the Spirit. Verse 5, wait on the Spirit. Verse 8, the Spirit will clothe you with power. The means by which the mission proclaiming the message given to us by Christ and the New Testament apostles is going to be given is by the power of the Holy Ghost. In other words, we're a supernatural people. We can't do what God tells us to do. Because we're commanded doesn't mean we can. Ought doesn't mean can. We're going to need what is called grace. By the grace of God, I am what I am. We will have to speak and trust God to give us the strength as we step out timidly that God will give us the grace to wake up as, go to bed as lambs and wake up as lions to speak. And whenever we speak, God is going to have to, as he says, uh, God um, uncovered the heart of Lydia to understand the things spoken by Paul. God will have to affect men's hearts, and he will have to convince them of their sin, their lack of righteousness, and the imminency of judgment. And he will have to draw them to the knowledge of Christ. Is that okay with y'all? We can't do this. All we can do is throw the net. He's going to have to bring them into the net. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he has established within the first four sentences your socks and shoes. This is who the church is. We're people with a mission, a message given by the apostles of a divine man who died 
And our job is to trust the power of the Holy Ghost to do something we can't do. We're a supernatural people. Our truth is given by God. Our Savior is given by God. The apostles are designated by God. The message is given by God. And the power to do this is given by God. We can't do this, but God can. Well, in verse 5, we are going to commence a brand new age of human history. He says in verse 4, you wait for what the Father promised, the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, John baptized with water, you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. In 10 days, Penta, 50, that Christ has been raised now for 40, between day 40 and day 50, they have 10 days, and then the Spirit of God is going to come, and you're going to have a new dispensation, a new rule of God's covenant people. Not by rules on the outside that you keep, but by an unction, a rebirth on the inside, which you naturally will follow. It's called the New Testament, or the New Covenant. And it will divide your Bible into law and grace, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And so... The baptism is coming. The Old Testament work of the Holy Spirit was to take prophets, priests, and kings and give them a temporary um, ability to do something for a short period of time. And then it would depart, usually. The New Testament baptism is not, in, is not discriminately given to a few to do a particular work for a particular time. It is to baptize them. The baptizo, just as you lower something and raise it up, the Spirit of God is going to kill you. And then He's going to raise you up anew. As Christ died to the penalty and power of sin and then rose, you are going to be placed in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. And so this work of the rebirth of death and resurrection, every man in Christ is a new creation. You must be born again of the water, washing your sin clean, and the Holy Spirit giving you a new heart. We're about to begin it here in 10 days, he says. It's coming. And so, we're going to begin a new age. The rebirth by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, imparting all blessing to the believer. He will now be justified. He will have righteousness imputed to him. The wrath of God will be propitiated. His sin will be redeemed. He will be reconciled back to God. He will be gifted to serve him and dwell by the Holy Spirit, reborn, and someday raised from the dead. And that's all going to occur at the point of salvation there will be no second blessing because you can't do better than the first. And so all of this is about to start. There's going to be a brand new age of grace that's going to begin. Not just law to Israel, but grace to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. We're about to go worldwide on the knowledge of God. And it's about to start right now. In, in 10 days. Well, uh, verse 6. They now instinctively ask a question. Is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? They ask that question for two reasons. Number one, they're standing on the Mount of Olives. And Zechariah 14 says when Messiah begins his reign, he will begin it on the outside of the eastern gate. He will begin it on the Mount of Olives. And so they say, is this it? And the kingdom age is accompanied by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Joel 2 says, on all flesh. Ezekiel 36 says, in the day of the kingdom, he will wash men with pure water and renew them by the Holy Spirit, the water and the Spirit. Jeremiah 31 says, he will write his law in our hearts and on our minds by his Spirit. And so when he said, we're about to begin in the full giving of the Holy Spirit, all the, the 12 knew what that meant. They had been to Sabbath school. They'd been to synagogue. 
they knew what that meant. The king is about to begin his kingdom. And so they asked, is it at this time you're beginning the restoration to Israel? They recognized that God wasn't finished with the nation of Israel, that the nation had rejected him. Is it at this time you're going to establish your kingdom? Are you about to go down this Mount of Olives, over the Brook Kidron, into the Eastern Gate, into the Temple Mount, and whistle everybody out of the pool and begin the kingdom of God? Is this it? Well, here's what Jesus said. In verse 7, he says, that the uh, Greek says, none of your business. <laughs> it, it really doesn't. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the epics. A time and an epoch is God's designation of an age of human history. The time in the Garden of Eden, of innocence. After the fall, you have uh, man whose conscience enlivened him to sin and was come to come to God in mercy and in sacrifice. Man rejected that and it became evil. And then you have the flood. And now you have a time of government. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall blood be shed. The establishment of government. Uh, how did it work? The Tower of Babel. Man rejected God again. And so God sends out the nations. They become 70 nations. And now you begin the time of the promises of the nation of Israel. God and a Babel occurs in Genesis 11. What's Genesis 12? Abraham. And in you all the nations shall be blessed. We're going to start a new nation. And he gave promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12. They go into Egypt. They grow to be a great nation. He leads them out and then he does something different. We're not just going to walk under the... the uh, promises we're going to come to Sinai and I'm going to have Moses he's going to go up 40 days he's going to come down with law there's going to be hygienic law there's going to be uh, civil law there's going to be uh, symbolic um, ceremonial law and there'll be moral law okay so I'm going to have a nation for my own possession now well someday Christ is going to return and we will have the time of the kingdom of God. Y'all believe that? I happen to believe that. The kingdom of God. Well, he said, I'm about to send the Holy Spirit. And so they ask, is this it? And he said, you don't need to know that time. He doesn't say you guys are going to become the kingdom. He doesn't say you will establish a kingdom of God on earth. He says, it's coming in a future day. And I'm not going to tell you when it is. But he does say this. He says, you're going to, in verse 8, have to do something. Now, I want to stop here for just a second. We've got our mission, our message, the authoritative men, and the means by the Holy Spirit. The next key idea I showed you is the church is going to begin an age of rebirth, of a new covenant with God, not by law, but by grace. New creations. That age is about to begin with the church. But then he said, you're not the final manifestation of the kingdom. Is this the kingdom? No. But you're going to be reborn and we're about to begin the kingdom. And so the question, and this is a key foundational idea of these first 11 verses. If the kingdom is not here in its final form, but if the outpouring of the Holy Spirit has been given for rebirth, the law has been set aside, now we are under grace, not just to Israel, but to all the nations. How do we perceive ourselves? If this isn't the kingdom, but the kingdom has commenced, now how do we see it? So what is our perception of ourselves? Well, it's the idea that, uh, well, let me show it to you like this. If, if you look in your Old Testament, you see two mountaintops, and they look like they're right next to each other. One has a cross on it, and the other has a throne on it, a crown. The first coming of Christ, and then the second coming. And so you see them right next to each other. And it looks like they're almost simultaneous. As you look in the Old Testament, you see the death of Messiah, and you see his reign. Well... You drive up to it, these mountain peaks, and you find out that they're not side by side. 
that one is at a great distance back here. It just looked like it was. There is an unseen valley of time in between the death of Christ and his return. What is that valley of time? Wait a minute. In the Old Testament, you're not sure what it is. But once you come up to the top of Calvary, now you can see it. Is it this time you're going to come and establish your reign, having died and giving out your spirit? The answer, no, not yet. But you'll be my witnesses. You'll start in Jerusalem, you go to Judea, then Samaria, and then you go to the outermost parts of the earth. And then, verse 9 through 11, I'm coming back. And so what is this valley of time in between that you can't see from the Old Testament? You see it in the New, and thus we would call it a mystery. It's a certain age. It's not to Israel, but to the church. We would call this age the church age, the mystery that you have to come to Calvary to see. The Christian knows the meta-narrative that God is working. Law, Christ, death, grace. The church age and mercy, and then the return. Did y'all get taught that in high school and college? You didn't. Only the Christian can see it. We're the guys that stand on the mountain and we know what God is doing. And so, we have a mission, a message, an authoritative group of men, and we have a means. We also know that we are beginning an age, the age of the giving of grace, of redemption. A period of time that the ark has been built. You know, whenever Noah built the ark, you had seven days of ingathering, and then it hit. We're in a period of ingathering. Because someday the flood's going to come, the ark is going to be lifted up, it's going to come back, and it's going to return. The ark goes up, then it returns and they all come out to establish the kingdom. And so it's about to happen again with this heavenly Noah. And so we have got this church age, and we know that he's coming. The church has commenced the kingdom. But is the kingdom completed? Say no. No, because I'll have to kick you out of the church, and I don't want to do it. No. The kingdom has commenced, but it is not completed. The kingdom is now, but it's not yet fully experienced. And so that's how the Christian sees himself. In other words, let me expand it a little bit. This is a key understanding we have to have. Now let me stop right there, because if y'all don't understand it, we're going to lock the doors, we're going to start all over. You have to understand that. There's no use going home because of rangers. Uh, <laughs> Romo's hurt. Rangers are they're doing what they do. So, but let's continue. So we need to understand who we are. We are those who have bowed the knee and confessed that he is Lord. Amen? Someday, how many knees will bow and how many tongues will confess? All of them. Have they all bowed and confessed yet? They have not, but we have. We are the first of a new world coming that have bowed. Secondly, we are the ecclesia, the kaleo, the called, the called out. We're no longer merely Americans. We are Christians who live in America. Christians who live in Africa. Paul will begin his letters to the church of Jesus Christ in Philippi. They're in Christ at Philippi. So we are aliens in this world. We are part of the family of God. We have a double citizenship. We're primarily of God. We happen to live here. But our chief loyalty is to our king. Amen? And so if they want to make a rule affirming sodomy, that's what pagan people do. That's not what we do. If they want to have no-fault divorce and hook them on your mate, they can do that. 
That's not what we do. If they want to uh, say there is no distinction between men and women, that's what they can do. That has nothing to do with us. We're not primarily Americans. We are Christians who live in America. We're the Iglesia, the Ekkaleo. We're called out. Our loyalty is not to Nebuchadnezzar. It is to God, and as we work with Nebuchadnezzar, we help him as we can, but when he crosses that line, then we die. But that's who we are. You dig? Now, that's what the church has to understand. We're the people of God. We are what are called a peculiar people. We're the first of this world that will bow. You ready for this? We are an advanced team of a future extraterrestrial invasion. I know it's true because I read ahead. In Revelation 19, the heavens open and he descends and he establishes the kingdom of God. And we come with him. We are an advanced team of an ultimate extraterrestrial invasion. And our job now is we're to warn these guys he's coming. That's why 40% of your Bible is on that last day. Did y'all know that? 40% of your Bible says you better wake up. As a matter of fact, there are so many references to judgment, the return in hell, that it would be like if you drove to Austin, every mile you're seeing a sign that says, turn back. Anybody watch the TCU game lesson? Okay. Uh, and so we are a warning to the world. You better put the brakes on. Why have the Gentiles gathered together against the Lord and his Christ and said, I'll tear their fetters apart and cast their chains from me? The Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. He's going to come back. And so we're announcing, like Noah, for a hundred years, there's a flood coming. You better repent. You're crazy. All right. We are also a summons to the world. You need to repent. We are witnesses. He died, he rose, and he's coming back. That's why every gospel talks about the second coming. That's why your Bible ends with the second coming. History is not going to go on getting better every day in every way. It's not some evolutionary thing that's just going to keep on going. There is a return someday. The creation shall end in termination. And we happen to be a picture to the world of what the kingdom will look like. When men beat their swords into plowshares, they study war no more. And every man is going to have the new covenant in his heart when God removes evil from the world and the return of Christ and you now go into the kingdom of God. That you will have an obedient world. Men will bow the knee. How do you know that's true? Answer, go to church. Because when you go to church, you will look around and you will see rich guys and poor guys sitting together. You will see men and women sitting together. You'll see black guys, white guys, Hispanic guys, Asian guys, all kind of guys all sitting together because there's love and there's unity. You will not see in that place wickedness. You don't have to lock your car, hypothetically. <laughs> you don't have to lock your car because we don't steal. Is that right, Kip? We don't steal. That's wrong. You don't have to worry about walking in the parking lot at night here if there's us that are outside because we don't hurt people. We're the people of God. You don't have to protect your wife walking around there the men here because we don't do adultery. And so we don't cheat guys in business. And if we do, we call them before the elders. We call them to repent. If we can't help them, we have to remove them. Are you with me? We are a picture of what the kingdom will look like. We're a warning that he's coming. We're a call to men that he, not to be afraid of him, but to submit that they have been deceived as to who he is. This is a good God. That's our message. And we happen to be light and salt. We make the world a kinder, gentler place. We will establish medicine. We will have St. Luke's. We will have... Um, St. Jude's, we will have Presbyterian and Methodist and Truett, we will start hospitals. We'll start leprosariums down in Louisiana, the Catholic Church runs. We'll, we'll have the Red Cross, we'll have the Salvation Army, uh, St. Vincent de Paul's, 
We'll do all kind of good things. We'll establish constitutional government of a standard of right and wrong by which governments can be judged. And so we can't convert the world, but we'll make it more pleasant to be here. We'll invent, because in the image of God in man, we'll, we'll invent uh, medical care. Isn't that something? To keep him from hurting, we'll, we'll invent Novocaine. Glory. You know, <laughs> I'm for it. And so the, the church will make the world a better place until he comes. And we're also people that have to suffer. Because we have to stand, we have to speak. They don't like it. And we have to shed our blood from one end of the world to the other. Am I right? But we got to take the hit. That's the rules. That's why we don't go through the tribulation. Because our tribulation is now. We have to stand now. So, this and the fact that we know this is not the end time. This is the last days and he's coming. And we know that. And so, in this little template of 11 verses, he's given you a mission, a message, authoritative men, a means. And this is who you are. You are kingdom people prior to the coming. You're an advanced people. You're like, you're like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Zerubbabel, Joshua the high priest, Ezra, Esther, Mordecai. You are covenant people in a pagan land, becoming a blessing to a pagan land, announcing to them your God. And if they happen to tell you not to pray, then you're willing to die. That's who you are. And so is this an important text? To know who you are. See, that's why God has left you here. That's why you're here. I mean, are you here to make money? You know what they call gold in heaven? It's called asphalt. <laughs> we really don't need you. I mean, if you want to make money, that's good. Give it to me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, spread it around. But that's not why you're here. You're not here just to have pleasure and have fun. At the right hand, there are pleasures forever. We're put here for business. That's why we don't baptize you and hold you under, see, and send you to glory right there. You're here for a reason, and that's the reason. And there's no greater reason than to live, than to represent the living God. So God establishes that. You are kingdom people in a pagan world. And in verse 8, you don't know, or verse 7, you don't know when I'm coming. Verse 8, you can know this. You can be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This is what you do know, and this is why you're here. I said it last week, and I'll say it again. Best counsel I ever received as a young Christian was, don't worry about the will of God for your life. Concern yourself with the will of God. What did God do when he became a man and he came here? He lived holy. He believed right. He affected people. He started something new. And then he died for what he believed. And he said, that's what you've got to do, to follow in his steps. He said to me, his name was John McCain. He said, don't worry about what God's going to do with your life. Number one, he's not going to tell you. And number two, it'll change. As it, he'll move you here, move you here. And he said, he's not going to tell you. You put your oar in where the water is white, what God's doing. He is proclaiming the truth, bringing men to faith, and discipling them to glorify God and being faithful until the death. You do that. Now, how you make your money, it don't matter. Be honest. Make it well. Enjoy it. He'll lead you into that. But you got to get the core solid and why you're here. Let me ask you, American education, what does it educate on? The husk, how to make a living, not how to make a life. Amen? And if they try to do that, we'll fire them. Right? They better not say God or we'll fire them. So where's the kid going to learn a life? In the old days, in McGuffey's Readers, you would do your studies, then at the top right-hand corner, there would be verses to fix your life. The wage of sin is death. It would give you verses. Now we don't do that. All we do is we educate them in a hull, but we leave out the life as the one important. We've, we've become secularized. That's what the term means. Mannish 
secolorum, age to age. We're just into men, not into God. And so this is why we're here. You know, I trusted Christ, had a guy who played lineman for us named John Bowles came up to me. We were lifting weights. He looked at me and he said, something happened to you. And I said, yeah. He said, what was it? I said, you know that Jesus stuff? I was a really expert witness at the time. <laughs> you know that Jesus stuff? Yeah, I, I was Church of Christ. Well, I was Methodist. And I, I got dampened and all that. I got dumped. I said, yeah, we'll be all, we're all wet. I mean, we got wet. But do you know it's real? No. Yep. He, the Bible's true. He was the son of God. He died and he rose. I mean, our, the 60s, we were all desperate trying to find some kind of meaning out of the emptiness of the 50s, you know, personal peace and fluency. We just couldn't find it. And I said, I found it. It's, it's the person of Jesus Christ. He's alive. He's real. He came into my life. He changed me. The heck you say? He did. We came back for two-a-day workouts. I walked in the athletic dorm, and he walked up to me. I took one look at him. I said, you did it. I could just tell. And he said, yep. I said, what happened? He said, I had a date with this girl named Jan. She had the same story as yours. <laughs> just lined us up. Trusted Christ. Even an offensive lineman <laughs> can be saved. And that's something. And I said, you know, this is a great way to live. However I make my living, it doesn't matter. This is what I'm going to do right here. Then I found out you could get paid. And here I am. <laughs> and so, in verse 8, we got a map. This is another M word. We got a map now. You're going to start in Jerusalem. That's Acts 1 through 7. Do you all know that? In Acts 1 through 7, we stay in Jerusalem for about eight years. And then we go to uh, Samaria. You know why we go to Samaria? Because they started killing people. Who was the guy they killed and everybody took off? Stephen. And so in chapter 7, he's going to get killed. And in chapter 8, we're all going to head off to Samaria. And then there's going to be a guy named Saul of Tarsus. It's going to be the greatest enemy of the church. And in chapter 9, we're going to convert him. We're going to get rid of him. We're going to make him a child of God. And then from 9 to 28, we'll go to the outermost parts of the earth. So we go. 1 through 7 is Jerusalem and Judea. 8, Samaria. 9 through 28, the outermost parts of the earth. It goes like this. Where you are, then you do mission work. And so the, the map is going to be the entire world that we'll go to. When I was a young Younger guy, there was a guy, if you want to read a great book, get a guy named Stanley Ellison, E-L-L-I-S-E-N. He was the mentor of Dr. Mark Bailey, the, the president of Dallas Seminary. Mark Bailey said he had a grasp of his Bible greater than anybody he'd ever met. And um, I read something he did years ago, and it marked me. He said... You've got to remember that in the creation, it's the creation of the universe and the whole world. Then it's Adam who is the father to all men worldwide. And then you have the fall in the Garden of Eden that, that affects all man. And then you have the flood that God judges all men. And then you have the Tower of Babel where you have the, the judgment go out on the, on the confusion of the nations. He said that's all nations. So through the first 11 chapters of the Bible, the word Israel isn't even mentioned yet. Abraham isn't mentioned. It's all universal. And I remember Dr. Ellison, he taught at West, uh, what's up in Oregon? Western Conservative. He taught there for years. And he said, you got to remember, your Bible begins worldwide. God is the Lord of hosts. He's El Elyon. He's God Most High. He's not just the tribal deity of the Jew. He's all men. And then after this world that's been created, that has fallen and been judged, is in the thralls of idolatry, he takes one man out of Ur of Chaldees and moves him to his own country and gives him promises, incubates him to become a great nation, leads him out to Canaan, What's the guy's name? Abraham. And now in your seed shall the nations 
Be blessed. Israel is a communicator of truth to the entire world. They dropped the ball on their Savior. They didn't want him. They rejected Peter. They killed Stephen. They rejected Paul. He shook the dust off. He said, I'm going to the Gentiles. And so now God has set the blue chip down, and he's taken the cow chip. That's us. I'm going to now bring it in here, and I'm going to give it to you. And you are going to carry the ball, the nations. And now we go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and as the Abrahamic promise says, to the outermost parts. Until we get to Revelation chapter 6, how much of the world gets judged in the tribulation? All the world. Christ returns to rule over what? All the world from Israel. So the Bible begins with the world, it ends with the world, and in between, you've got the people of God that carry the message out. And so, this is our map. We are a people with a mission-mindedness. This is why I'm a little over, but life has no meaning, and there's no need to go home anymore. Okay? And so, this is why... uh, one of the worst things that can happen to a church is when it gets a fortress mentality that it no longer is committed to world and to the missions to where all it does now is worry about its coffee, its rugs and all that stuff and when that happens we just get to be inbred nasty little gremlins and we lose sight of why we are here and we become the stuff of Saturday Night Live skits And so a church is meant to be world-minded. That's when it gets fun, right there. Well, in 9 through 11, one other thing that we know is that he's coming back someday. He's lifted up out of their sight and a cloud receives him. A human being goes into heaven. When he dies on the cross, that's one anchor down here. Our sin has been paid for. When he sits down in heaven, that's the other end of the, of, the, of the redemption. That's the other anchor. And so we are safe and sound on this zip line. He has risen from the dead and he sat down in heaven. Can I lose my salvation? If Jesus sins in heaven, you'll lose your salvation. Anybody nervous? The Holy One of God will be the Holy One of God forever. And so a man has sat down and now the anchor holds. And we see him go into heaven. So how much do the apostles see? Alpha to Omega. And in verse 10, they're gazing intently, and there's two men in white clothing. They are angels. Angels are always the notary publics. Whenever Jesus is, or whenever John the Baptist is conceived, an angel tells Zacharias and tells Elizabeth, and then an angel tells Mary, and an angel tells Joseph, And when he is born, the shepherds have angels, and uh, an angel appears to the wise men and says, do this, go there. And at his um, temptation, angels were there. At Gethsemane, angels are there. Resurrection, angels are there. And at his ascension, angels are there. At his second coming, angels announce he's coming. And so it puts the stamp on all of the Bible, God gives his oath by his messengers. So do y'all believe he's coming? The angel spoke and said he's coming. Trivia, there's only one place in Jesus' life that you don't see angels. Give you a hint. He cries out, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the only place you don't see him. It is called Emmanuel's orphaned cry. Nobody's there. And so he is coming back. In verse 11, men of Galilee, don't be looking in the sky. You've got work to do. Verse 11, this same Jesus will return. And so we are to get to work. And so I conclude, what is the template, the log of the church? We have a mission. The mission is the message of evangelism of a supernatural Christ. We have a basis of authority. And it's not enlightened people or mystic people, emotional people or visionary people. It is the 12 that are accredited eyewitnesses that pen an 
a perfect, inerrant, final New Testament of which nothing can be added or taken away. They have a means, and we do, the power of the Holy Spirit, and our map is the entire world. Our identity is we are a kingdom people that are distinct from a pagan world. We're in the world, but we are not of it. And our hope is the second coming. Now, if you're the devil, what do you got to do? You have got to distract, or rather to deceive these people by error, or you have got to disqualify them for sin. Satan has got to get you sleeping with somebody else's wife. That you've got nothing to say. We have got to have you fall into road rage and hit somebody with a two-by-four. Okay. Or we have to get you distracted where you're not concerned with spiritual things, just making money. We get you busy. And if we can't do that, we get you with no depth to where all you walk by is everybody else's quiet times and you have no depth and you will bear no fruit. Or we have to get you divisive where you can't get along with anybody. Can Christians ever do that? Only breathing ones. All right. We've got to make you lose credibility with divisiveness. Then nobody's going to listen to you. And if we can't do that, we will create a new danger to where you're just afraid to open your mouth because you love the approval of men more than the approval of God. You fear those who can kill the body, but not him who casts body and soul into hell. Danger. And if we can't do that, we'll use the best one. That's called discouragement. You'll just get tired of persevering and you'll go silent. And so that is the plan that God has until he comes. I'm going to go home and I think I'll eat chicken <laughs> because it tastes good. And then later on, I'm going to read my Bible and enjoy it. And then I'm going to try to share the gospel with some folks and disciple some folks and try to live as long as I can, then go to heaven. Now, all the small stuff, I'm not going to sweat it, but I do know what I'm going to do with my life. Are you with me? Here we go. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time in your word and pray that as you gave us in 11 sentences, very quickly, you gave us a very simple template, a grid, a die of the way it's supposed to work. We have a mission, a message, men as authoritative, the apostles. We have the help of the Holy Spirit, we who begin the kingdom age and we look for the return. We who are the unique people of God, we shall go to Jerusalem right here in Denton. Then we will go on outward and then we will go to the enemies of God as far as we need to go and we will preach the gospel. I pray, Lord, that this church always will be doing these functions and you'll give us nice enough buildings, good enough Sunday schools. You'll give us uh, an air conditioner to, to meet in. Give us some basic things, but our mission is set in stone. And so help us. Uh, wide is our love, narrow is our bed, and we will not crawl in bed with anything that will defile us or lead us astray. No philosophy, no other religion. We will not back some politician that uh, we will put our credence in. All of our authority will rest in the Bible. And we'll thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.